and I will introduce our uh, next speaker, who is um, Marta Tolnes Fielstad. Marta is currently the curator at the uh, Perspective Museum in Tromsen, Norway. She was previously the curator at the University of Bergen Library uh, Picture Collection, which was part of this project. She was the co-editor of um, the book Library Information Studies for Arctic Social Sciences and Humanities, and also was the co-curator for this exhibition. Her talk today, as you see here, is titled Collecting, Preserving, and Sharing Photographs When Personal Initiative and Institutional Frameworks Intersect. And I will add on a personal note, she traveled over 30 hours to get here, multiple flights, several, one that was canceled and delays. Uh, so it was a, an arduous, arduous effort to get here, but managed to arrive and still in, with a cheerful smile and attitude. So we're very grateful that Marta is here and let's give her a warm welcome as well. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to Suntuk, uh, to all the wonderful people here at BYU for hosting the exhibition on, and for organizing the symp symposium as well. Uh, and in addition to the museum, especially director and in-house curator, Fiona, and for um, head of education, Philip, um, I'm especially grateful, of course, to the Scandinavian department with uh, Dr. Nate Kramer, who have generously invited me to be here today and made that possible. Uh, and it's a great honor to be doing this year's Lofte Bjarnason lecture today. Uh, and like Sa Shannon said, after many years of planning, uh, this week was actually the first time that I got to see the exhibition live. <laughs> so it's uh, extremely exciting to be here. Um, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be talking to you all today. Uh, and I wanted to take the opportunity today to speak um, not just about across the West, but also on a larger scale about Norwegian photographic history, more specifically about the institutional context of Norway's photographic history. The political and institutional frameworks that form the basis of much of the academic and practical work that has been done on historical photography in Norway uh, is also what made possible across the West and toward the North. As an idea, a collaboration across borders, a book, and an exhibition. And where we as curators and authors in the exhibition and in the various chapters in the book draw parallels and find connections between two nations' landscape photography practices, we have less of a focus on the collection practices that have allowed us access to these amazing, amazing pictures um, of images uh, and of Norwegian and American landscapes that we see here in the exhibition. And as historians, curators, and audiences, we are equally indebted to private collecting practices driven by a genuine love of and interest in photography and to a state-owned and politically governed institutional framework uh, for collecting and preserving images for all. And of course, as Across the West is a great example of these practices exist, exist side by side uh, and often in close contact and collaboration, even across borders. So these mechanisms are perhaps not so much discussed, at least that's been the case in Norway. And the works in this exhibition come from three different collections, two of which will be introduced here today. You'll hear later this morning or this afternoon um, from Ron Parisho, whose uh, generous support and loan of works but first and foremost, his decision to start collecting photography here in the US have made this exhibition possible. Um, the other main lender is the picture collection at the University of Bergen Library. Uh, and I will use my time here today to give a, by necessity, quite abbreviated introduction to the history of the collection by way of the works of one particular photographer whose works feature prominently in the exhibition, which is Knut Knutsen. And at the left in this picture, you see the founder of the picture collection, uh, Mrs. Susanne Bonga. And to the right, you see Ms. Ragna Solid, uh, who was the founder of another historic photography collection, which is called the Old Bergen Collection, and which is now at the City Museum of Bergen. Uh, 
and Norway was quite early in establishing national and regional photographic collections. In the 1960s has been described as the pioneer era, a time when work done on an institutional level was often based in the personal interest of individuals, archivists, uh, collectors, photographers, and local historians. And curator and photo historian Trun Bjule, whom Shannon mentioned before as well, he called the photographic preservation work in Norway from the 1970s onwards a decentralized grassroots movement, um, where photographs as material objects became absolutely central to the museum as an institution, not least due to the local collection and registration initiatives that were taking place across the land. And the work that was carried out at this time has impacted how photographs, both as objects and as motifs, are viewed, stored, catalogued and communicated to larger audiences. And I want to take as a point of departure here today, uh, one photographic object and image. And this is a reproduction of a glass plate negative made by Norwegian photographer Knut Knutsen in 1882. So this will serve as my starting point on a journey through the history of one photographer's work from commercial sales products through inclusion in the university collection as historic source material to his ultimate position as pivotal to a nation's iconography. And the picture I will be painting through my discussion of this object and image is, of course, not directly transferable to all the photographs in all Norwegian institutional collections, not least because this is a fairly well-known image in a very well-known archive, whereas the vast majority of the many tens of millions of photographs that are held in collections, both public and private, are and will remain largely unseen objects. Even so, I think it will shed some light on how Norwegian photographic cultural heritage has been collected, preserved, and ultimately shared with audiences from the 1960s onwards, a project that continues today with um, our work on across the West and toward the North. And Knut Knutsen, who is seen here, a third to the right, surrounded by his sisters and uh, their husbands, all of them looking slightly scary. Um, <laughs> He was born in 1832, and he grew up on his family farm in Hardanger in the Norwegian West Country. And as a young man, he forged a very successful career, or rather two careers. Um, he was a fruit tree farmer in the region of Hardanger, and he was a traveling photographer. And his sisters and extended family took care of the fruit tree business, whilst he worked as a photographer in Bergen, the nearest city and the second largest in Norway. And here in Bergen, uh, Knudsen opened a photographic portrait studio in 1864, um, and around the same time started traveling across Norway, creating photographs that were aimed at the rapidly growing tourist market. And you'll hear more about Knudsen later today by Toril Jasvik. Uh, but while she will be focusing as on a specific type of images, my focus is on the pro his production and his resulting archive as a whole. So this is a positive version of the glass plate that I showed previously, uh, and it's one of the many thousands of picture views or landscape prospects that Knudsen made in his 40-odd year career. And now it's perhaps easier to see that it depicts, it depicts a vast mountainous landscape with a carriage road that's going diagonally through, um, and a smaller, well-trodden path leading from the road out onto a looking point. And here, a man has turned his back to the view and is looking towards the photographer and towards us, and toward a parked cart on the shoulder of the road, laden with box, boxes and bundles, and a mysterious dark shape at the very foreground of the image. And this image is taken not far from the previous one, um, and it shows a close-up of a glacier, the Buerbrian Glacier in Hardanger. And the um, mysterious bulky shape that I mentioned in the previous image is here as well. And now it's easier to see that it's some sort of umbrella or a tent. And in fact, this is Knut Knudsen's darkroom tent. So on his cart, Knudsen would keep solutions of chemistry, boxes of glass plate negatives, and this tent, which allowed him to prepare the plates and develop them on the spot. And I say aloud, but actually this was a prerequisite for his work. In the first decades of his uh, work, he had to do this work in the field, like prepare the plates and do all the developing there. So, so this was one of his main tools. He needed his, his tent. 
Uh, and throughout his career, Knudsen produced something like 12,000 glass plate negatives, um, and working with wet plates where he needed his, his tent as late as 1882. And an astounding 4,000 of his glass plates are wet plate negatives, which makes it a very large collection of wet plate negatives. Um, I don't know of any larger collection. Uh, and Hardanger, which was Knudsen's home county and where he made these images, um, many of which are also on display in the exhibition, uh, was a popular region for tourists. Um, and Knudsen actually made 2,000 exposures just in this region alone. And through the, though the picture postcard was yet to be invented, tourists very much wanted to commemorate their travels with photographic images. So traveling with horse and carriage, foreign visitors, particularly British and Germans, explored the landscapes of fjords and mountains, as well as the modern roads and hotels. And Knudsen was one of several photographers who made a career out of following the same roads as his tourists did, documenting the sites and amenities, and selling the images as album and prints. And Knudsen was extremely successful, um, and eventually he earned enough money to pay for the construction of this impressive building, which is still on Bergen's main square. And here he received customers wanting portraits taken. Uh, he stored his growing archive of negatives, because 12,000 glass plates take up quite a lot of space. Uh, and he employed an unknown number of people to make and retouch prints as well. Uh, so these images to the left are close-ups from the previous image, and you can see in the top one, the, the glass windows in the attic where he had his portrait studio, which allowed light in so he could make his portrait. Uh, while to the sides of the door on the ground floor, you can see the display cases where he, uh, where he puts out pictures to advertise his work. But this was not the only place where he advertised and sold his images. He also sold prints on commission at hotels and travel agencies, both in Bergen, Bergen and in the region, but even abroad as well. Uh, and in order to present his work, he made sales albums. Uh, one, this one, I think, which is on display in the museum. Uh, and these albums contained from just a few to several tens of album and photographs, which customers then could look through and order from. Um, and so far today, I've only seen you black and white images. Uh, that's not what the images in this album looked like. That's not what the images in the exhibition looked like. Uh, because prospective buyers in the 19th century would see these monochrome soft images in purple, yellow, or brown tones, uh, album and prints. Um, and these prints, the size of them is determined by the size of the glass plate negative. So the size of glass that you had in your camera, that was the size of image that you got which is the reason why uh, some of the cameras that you'll see in the pictures in the show are huge, because the photographers wanted to make big pictures, so they had to have big cameras. Uh, and American photographers, um, or some of them at least, used bigger cameras than the Norwegian ones. So the biggest uh, glass plates that Knudsen used were about nine by 11 and a half inches, and on a later slide I will show you one of those as well. And we know from the very few written sources that are left in Knudsen's archive um, that, uh, such as this advertisement, that he also sold prints to foreign customers. He had travel agents in Germany, the UK, and in America who would sell his prints. Uh, and we also know that he on several occasions exhibited prints in world fairs, uh, including in Paris in 1889 and in Philadelphia in 1876. And these fairs offered photographers the opportunity to study photography from across the globe, and also to connect with audiences and therefore customers. But even more important in this respect to, to sell images was the extremely popular stereo image. And unfortunately, time is too short for me to discuss stereos in any depth. Um, but very briefly speaking, a stereo consists of two almost identical photographs taken with a camera with two lenses, approximately the distance of a person's eyes. And when you um, um, mount them on a cardboard backing, like in these images here, put them in this 
special viewer, you see them in, in 3D. And it was extremely popular for many decades. Um, and um, Ron has actually created an amazing digital presentation where you can put glasses on and see images in 3D here in the exhibition as well. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. It's really good fun. Uh, and he also told me that an, an astounding 75 to 85 percent of U.S. photographers' output was actually in stereo cards. Uh, so that, in other words, most people would see these types of images, not the large prints that we see in the exhibition. And although time is short, I did want to mention very briefly, um, as a curiosity really, this um, stereo from a private collection in, in Norway. Um, when the owner examined this stereo, he realized that the images are not slightly different, they are exactly the same, just cut a little bit differently. <laughs> so that when a buyer came home with this, they would be sorely disappointed because there's no 3D effect in it at all. <laughs> But I think it illustrates the popularity of the stereo cards and like the extent to which the publishers would go to get new motifs into their, their sales catalogs. And Knudsen's sales catalog included 1,973 stereo views from all of Norway. Uh, and these photographs are all reproductions of half of the plates. And as photo historian Neil Morgenstern pointed out, as far back as 1987, Quote, Knudsen ran a business and was influenced by the thoughts and interests of those he made images for, first and foremost, jurists visiting Norway, end quote. But Norwegian audiences also bought his images, and Knudsen's stereo views are a good example of how he aimed his photographs as two distinct audiences at the same time. On the one hand, the foreign traveler, interested in the quaint, perhaps even exotic, traditional Norway, and on the other, the modern Norwegian, whose interest was with, was with the distinctly national. And as most of you in this audience know, um, Norway got its constitution and left twin kingdom with Denmark in 1814. So at the time of Knudsen's travels, it was a very young nation. And Knudsen's photographs must be seen in relation to the nation building taking place, culturally and economically, and which led to the dissolution of the union with Sweden as late as 1905. As such, he made sure to include both the modern and the quaint in his images, from the old-fashioned summer pastures with the milkmaids and goat herders to the bustling new roads and hotels popping up across the land. And as we go into in much more detail in the exhibition, 19th century photography was key to the nationalism and nation-building projects taking place in Norway and also in the U.S. for tourists and citizens in a young nation alike. So, what does this glimpse into the photographer Knudsen say about Norwegian collecting practices and why is it relevant for us here today? I want to jump ahead in time to the 1960s and to Bergen, where most of the Norwegian photographs in the exhibition are held today. And here, the founding of what would become today's picture collection, which is a university-owned collection of 1.2 million photographs, can be credited to one person, Mrs. Bonga, from my first slide. And in the 1960s, Mrs. Bonga was a secretary at the university library. And she took, stack, uh, she took note of the many stacks of photographs that she saw like lying around the books and all the paper material in the library. And she asked permission to start cataloging them and sort through them. And from 1967, the picture collection was officially established as one of the first photographic collections in the country. Ostensibly, her model was the map and image collections at the Royal Library in Copenhagen. However, she was probably also inspired by a directly competing picture collection in Bergen, founded by librarian Miss Ragnar Skolid at some point in the early 1950s, so really quite early. And unfortunately, I don't have time today to do any of these pioneers the justice that they deserve, but I do find it extremely interesting that these two collections were founded approximately at the same time uh, by two women, and then they were continued to be uh, run also by women, mostly on a volunteer basis for decades afterwards. Um, and also after people have started to be paid to do it, like myself, it's, it's been a lot of women who's been working in these collections. And these same individuals who collected and catalogued photographs made tremendous efforts in terms of collecting information, or what we today call metadata, 
uh, not least through making exhibitions like the one seen in this slide, where they specifically ask the audiences to contribute information on old photographs, or what we today call crowdsourcing. And both of these Bergen collections grew as other individuals gifted them images. And that could be one or two photographs, or it could be larger donations. And in 1967, the picture collection received a generous gift from a local journalist, photographer, and collector, Gustav Brusing. Uh, some 20,000 historical and then contemporary images, mainly from the Bergen area. And though my historical recap today is a simplification, the roles of individual, individuals such as Mrs. Bonga and Ms. Sulid were both working within the larger frameworks of libraries and museums, and Gustav Brusing as a private, co private collector and beneficiary to the same systems cannot be overestimated. Without them, tens and thousands of historic photographs would have been lost to us today, depriving us not only of important historical information, but also important uh, pieces of our national art and visual culture. Uh, and I should note also that Bonge and Solid wrote some of the earliest and most important books on Norwegian photographic history. So they didn't just collect, they also contributed uh, to the national literature on photographic history. And when I found all three of them in the collection, I couldn't resist making a slide to, to show you how, how they're presented in the collection as well. And from the start, the picture collection did include loads of portraits, both important historical figures and others. Uh, but additionally, it focused on motifs from the city and its surroundings and on material related to university research, such as this photograph from, from 1908, which documents an ocean research course held by the university. And you can also see a photographer there who's documenting uh, yeah, and we're documenting them again. So there's, there's at least two photographers present there. Um, the collection grew quickly, and by 1973, it comprised 120,000 images, all registered in a system that was entirely made up by Mrs. Bonga, and which took provenance as its starting point, which means that images from one photographer or one archive collector were registered under one shared main signature, and it didn't matter what the materiality of the original was, whether it was plastic negatives, daguerreotypes, glass plates, or paper positives. And while most of the material came as gifts from individuals and organizations, in 1974, the collection made its, as far as I know, first purchase, which was the Knudsen collection. And Knudsen had passed away in 1915, but his business continued under the leadership of his nephew, uh, who was also known as Knut Knudsen. So with the later images, it's a little bit difficult to know whether it was Knut Knudsen or Knut Knudsen who was the photographer. Um, we, we've kind of given up trying to, to solve that. <laughs> um, but now in the mid-1970s, the Knudsen company wanted to get rid of a large collection of glass plate negatives and some other bits and pieces that were sort of clogging up their hallways. Um, and as the company had made some money from selling reproductions of Knudsen the Older's images, the owners wanted some compensation for the archive. Um, for just 100,000 Norwegian kroners, which was a rather large sum, sum then, but which equals to just around $75,000 today, the University Library purchased seven huge wooden cabinets containing about 20,000 glass plates if in various formats and what would turn out to be around 40,000 album and prints, as well as some original photographic equipment and wooden transport crates. And you see one of the cabinets there. They are really amazing objects in their own right and they were used until about 10 years ago to actually store his, uh, his glass plates until we had conservators come in and tell us that, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> and we had to buy new, new cabinets. Um, so this hall became the Knut Knudsen collection, and it's a huge archive from one individual 19th century photographer, which documents 50 years of changes to landscape and society in Norway. And that's also as promised me with a glass plate. And at the picture collection, part of a university library which also caters for a wider audience, Knut Knudsen images 
very soon became the go-to collection when publishers wanted book illustrations, when TV producers needed historical context, and for historians looking for supporting evidence. Uh, and in all these instances from the 1970s onwards, the images were reproduced in black and white as reproductions from the glass plates, even after color printing stopped being more expensive than black and white, which used to be the case. And I think there are two main reasons for insisting on the originality of the negative rather than on the positive print. Uh, firstly, there are more singular images in negative format than in print. So taking the now familiar image from Hardanger as an example, despite Knudsen making at least four exposures from a very similar point of view, no albumen original exists as far as we know. And second, the quality of the images, which is possible from a glass plate negative, is astounding even now. So as you see here uh, from a recent exhibition, enlargement directly from the glass plates allow us to see details that have previously not been consciously seen since Knudsen himself capture them, and he might not even have been aware of them when he took the photographs. So these prints are about three or four meters long, uh, and looking at them really is like pointing a magnifying glass uh, at history. Um, and I remember working with this particular exhibition when we, when we blew the images up, we would see things that just astounded us, you know, people um, looking through windows, <laughs> through the curtains, we found a number of photographers out on the street documenting this great city fire that had happened in Bergen. And yeah, just loads of um, details that nobody would have seen at the time. Um, and, but be even if this is the case with the glass plate reproductions, um, the albumen prints, the original albumen prints, they have a richness to them that black and white reproductions lack. And they are also direct physical traces of the photographer's working practices that carry the marks of time. And that was just some of the reasons that Shannon and I decided to only include original material in our exhibition. Even though that meant leaving out a range of images with important or special subjects, such as the photograph from the lookout point. And don't try to read this. <laughs> uh, as Shannon discussed earlier, Photography played a key role in the nation building project in Norway from the middle of the 19th century, central to both Norwegians and foreign visitors' view of the nation. As Knudsen's images continued to reach new audiences, historians started taking an interest in them, not just for their evidentiary value, or in other words, to prove that something looked like this or existed at that point of time, but also as, ex as expressions of the sentiments of a specific time. As examples of a new visual and photographic language, and as important pieces of the formation of the nation's iconography. And this new awareness of photographers' role in history coincided with a new interest in photography as art, as something physical and collectible. And in 1989, collector of photography Robert Mayer included reproductions of album and photographs by Knudsen in his catalog essay, The Forgotten Tradition. And here he stated that, quote, most of the concepts we have about the typical about Norwegian landscape were formulated by photographers such as Knut Knudsen and Axel Lindahl in the last century. They inherited motifs from the national romantic painters but renewed them and established an independent photographic tradition." End quote. So when Shannon and I started work on Across the West in 2014, maybe, <laughs> Uh, Knudsen's images were by far the only ones we looked at, considered, discussed, and evaluated in a process that took a good couple of years, and which included works by a number of absolutely amazing Norwegian and American photographers. As a collection of outstanding original 19th century photographs by one individual, however, uh, it was the largest body of work we encountered and familiarized ourselves with. And I should say that before Shannon came into my life, I'd been working in the picture collection for a few years, and I kind of avoided the Knudsen collection because it was just so daunting. So she forced me to, to get familiarize myself with it. Our work was guided by the collection and preservation practices in Bergen from the 1960s onwards, practices that formed the framework for how we could search and find images both digitally and physically in the stores and we're indebted to the individuals who founded, organized, and lobbied for the collection, to the old Knudsen business who sold rather than discarded the large amount of glass plates and old prints, 
to the private collectors whose small and large donations have added to the Knutsen collection over time, and to the university who have funded the picture collection and its growing number of staff through decades, including the work on this exhibition. But most of all, we're indebted to the photographers who traveled the width and length of Norway and the US, capturing a moment in time when national, ide uh, national identities were constructed on both sides of the Atlantic, when landscapes became the focus for development and resource ex extraction, and when travelers such as this American lady discovered ex and experienced the land in new ways. Thank you.